You are listening to Off Planet Radio at offplanetradio.com. There are things that I know, but there are things that I do not. Various possible futures are happening simultaneously. I can tell you all of them, but I cannot tell you which one of them will come to pass, because every action causes ripples, consequences both obvious and unforeseen. Welcome to the Off Planet Radio podcast. I'm Randy Moggins. The website is offplanetradio.com. For the show, I have a special guest host, somebody that's not been around for a while, and we're going to talk to her. Um, she is a longtime veteran journalist in the paranormal realms of the Internet. Both her personal perspective and her passion for capturing authentic stories that involve real people have distinguished her from the standard woo-woo fare of blogs and YouTube channels. The stories she presents mix urban legend and spooky fringe science with a twist of a psychological whodunit. Her voice is one of both the curious observer and involved participant. She mixes empathy with a distance reasoning facility. And with me from Long Island, New York, is Chris Hawley. Good evening and welcome, Chris. Oh, good evening, Randy, and thank you, and it's good to come back and have a bit more conversation. It is. And I might add that people must understand the subject matter in which we work is draining, and you can't just hit at this day in and day out without losing your mind. It needs an enormous amount of focus and concentration and thought and reading and research and talking and interviewing, and it's exhausting. So you do need to break away and say, okay, you know, I need to go go fishing for a couple of weeks and completely clear my mind and not think about any of this so I can come back and actually deal with it. That is very true. So, and if you don't feel that way, I don't know what you're doing, but that's the way I feel and you feel and many others I work with. This is one place where you need a break. It's not really, it doesn't lend itself to on demand. Um, as much as we would like to be able to produce the material, the material itself produces itself. We're just simply dealing with um, the ramifications of a reality stream that we tap into. And the same is true for finding people out there that are quality guests to do these things with. Um, I, when, I, when I took my leave of absence back in March, I explained the situation as such that I felt overall the alternative media, and specifically the paranormal, lacks in quality largely because people are trying to fit into schedules of doing shows on weekly and God much let's let's God forbid trying to do something on a daily basis of this nature because you simply can't pull quality people in that requires time to get to know people to know their material and to have some some depth in what you're doing so unfortunately this material doesn't lend itself to the um the daily rush of so-called news and information the way people are used to getting it plus the fact chris that people are information junkies and i've repeatedly said this there comes a time when you simply have to shut things off, you have to go, you have to get quiet, you have to learn to be with yourself, and you have to pull yourself away from all the stimulation of everything that's going on around us right now because the world is spinning at a dizzying rate. Well, the world probably is going at its rate, the actual planet and nature. It's us and what we've done with this technology that has us, as you said, at a dizzying rate where you can't keep up, you can't, you, you, we live in a time of sound, sound bites and actually limited information on multiple subjects. So you get a little bit of everything, but you really don't get to know a lot about anything. And that's not good. 
on many levels. And the most basic level, of course, is knowing a little bit about a subject may be very dangerous because you may actually need to know the whole, you know, enchilada to make a decision or understand how to handle it or deal with it or work with it or whatever it might be. And this society does not do that anymore. It's a soundbite society where you make snap knee-jerk decisions and opinions, and guess what? That doesn't work in the world. You just can't go through life like that. I mean, you can, but you're not going to have a quality life or make quality decisions or ever know what the hell you're doing. So you got to turn this stuff off, and you're not kidding, and go out and realign yourself with the actual reality of the space and time and the earth and, and, and the, the cycle that you are living on this planet before you run in and jump into, you know, the world of the Internet, which was what it is. And yeah. everybody is in a science fiction bubble of non-reality. And that's where they live most of their lives now. Instead of the opposite, where they come in and have a dose of that and then get back to real time life, they 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 live in the fake and and have lost their way with the real. And I I just think that if we continue like this, we're actually going to see a complete total collapse of the society and the civilization around us. But that's just my opinion, but that's why I have to shut down and go out and garden, or just sit on my deck and stare, or go down to the water, which is a big thing. I'm an islander. I love the beach. I love the water. I love the blue sky and the blue water. And it, it's, it also gives off its ions, I think it is, and it calms you, and it realigns you, and it meditates you out, and do all those things. Otherwise, I would have been burned out 10 years ago. I wouldn't be able to hold a uh, conversation with you on any subject because I'd just be, you know, good. Well, I, I, if you, I think, too, it's fair to say that what we're seeing now in the culture is a lot of people who are burning out and don't understand why. We live in a world now that's saturated by um, all types of waves, microwaves, um, low frequency oscillations, EMFs, EMPs. Um, we're being bombarded energetically. Our bodies were not de designed to live in an electronic atmosphere such as we have. And certainly since World War II, it's proliferated to a rapid extent. We have radio, television, uh, satellites, now the Internet and Wi-Fi, which is everywhere. And now these devices that we walk around with in our pockets, purses and good God, stuck in front of our faces a lot of times, these, these mobile phones that themselves are, are, are conductors of things that are literally damaging our, our nervous system, our, our cellular structure, and our psychology because we're being rewired. As Absolutely. You know, I just read that. Now, if you're listening to us and you want to check this out, you're going to have to do a search on your own because I don't have the link. But I just read an article written by some science group that the, they are finding that the young kids today, where they are constantly li linked to something, they're constantly wired into something, are having their brains actually rewire to work more like a, a, um, a computer, a man-made computer, then the brain should be working. And that is not good because what that's doing, you know what that's doing, Randy, it's lining us up to become part of this robotic, right. half-human, half right, completely controlled human type of being. Not, not a you. Yeah, it goes back to that, it. that show we did, oh, gosh, probably over a year ago now on uh, artificial intelligence and, and, and yeah. uh, transhumanism. And the right. fact that, you know, you and I have the sense and your real time contactees have said the same thing. Over the, and over. The species will not sustain this at some point. You know, there's going to be a divergence and. Um, we're going to have to make choices about what we're going to be. Are we going to be synthetics or are we going to stay with the course of the normal, natural human progression? And, the new, and being a human means 
a, a self will. You you have choices that you can think the way you want. You can have opinions the way you want. That will be taken away. In fact, you see it now. You talk to a young person today, and they will tell you what the latest thing they were told to think by way of social media or whatever it might be is not what they actually think out and feel for themselves or researched and thought about and formed their own opinion. It's always the fad. It's always to be in. It's always the cool opinion. It is always the opinion that has been given to you that you have not developed by yourself. That never occurs to them. You know, it's funny. Before I forget this thought, I just want to bring it in. You, of all people, used to say to me when we would be disgusted about something, I just like am so annoyed. I'm going to go outside and realign myself. Every day, I take my bare feet and go and place them on the ground, on the earth, and feel the earth and realign myself. And I thought to myself when you first say that all the time, that is so dopey until I started doing it. And I would get aggravated with something and go outside and kick off whatever shoes I had on and stand on the ground right outside in my garden and feel so much better. Now, I don't know what that is, but you should bottle it and sell it. because That's called works. grounding. And that's it's real important. The and, it's, and you could talk about it, Randy, because it works. The earth has a, has a resonance field, and it is conducted through the rocks and the soil. Um, I happen to believe that all things are living. The earth itself has a resonance field. It is a living entity, not the way we understand it, but it conducts a certain energy. We are connected to it. We came from the earth. And the act of going out and reconnecting with the soil, and I mean, I'll grant you when there's uh, 10 inches of snow on the ground and it's 20 below zero, this is probably not a wise thing to do. There are substitutes for it. Um, walking on wooden floors, not concrete wooden floors, um, just getting as close as possible to natural materials, um, wood, brick, stone, things like that. Even if you just get your hands into clay, this is why um, <laughs> this goes on another tangent as well. Um, years ago, way, way, way back, I learned how to throw clay. That's people who do pottery are very in touch with the earth because they're 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 in tactile proximity with the elements of the earth. All of these things work on our nervous system, on our electrical system, on our 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 brain waves to keep us connected to the place we came from especially in this time when when we're being hijacked by this electrosphere that they've built around us electronically and technologically so it sounds weird it sounds crazy but i'm telling you work. you go out do this for 15 maybe 20 minutes bare feet just contact with the ground and while you're doing that walk relax deep breaths really help if you practice any form of yoga or meditation this is a perfect time to do something like that prayer Absolutely. whatever your spiritual whatever your spiritual connection is but it's so important right now to do this it'll keep you healthier it'll keep you more rooted to who you are and there is a spiritual aspect to this that you know it's unique for every person that does it and if you are a person that spends a lot of time inside a lot of time sitting in front of your computer on Facebook, Twitter, whatever, Instagram, whatever the thing is that you're doing, and you start to feel down, depressed, and disconnected, and a bit nasty, and you're cranky, and you're not getting along with everybody, just listen to us. Turn the stuff off and go outside. Do what Randy just said. Stand on the ground, and, and if you can't do that, just go out and sit in the sun, put your feet on the ground, wear your sneakers, I don't care, your, your flip-flops, get out there, and if you can, go into a park someplace with trees and grass and flowers or garden or buy a little plant and sit outside and hold the damn thing. Yeah. All those things will reconnect you, realign your brain. You know, the other thing... It feels so much better. The other thing, since you brought it up, water, and specifically yeah, I, yeah. the ocean. Yep. Um, this is really important about that. 
at least once a year, I get a feeling that, that grabs me where I need to go be preferably near salt water. And, and I've read studies now about this. You, when we examine our own biology, remember, we're part of the earth, but we also come from the oceans. Our blood is salt water. It's a saline solution at its core. When we connect to the electrolytic aspects of salt water, specifically, but even just a lake, water that's moving, we are reconnecting again with the elementals of our of our own being because we come from we come from earth, we come from water, we come from uh, the air element and the fire element. All these elements are part of who we are. So you know, people who enjoy fires. I mean, we have a beautiful fireplace on our deck, and when weather permits, we go out there and we build wood fires. There's something about these things that spiritually reconnects us to the elementals and allows us to regenerate and connect to who we are inside of nature. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> and you want a wonderful experience. If I don't know if you're, any of you can do it, but a barn fire on a beach. Oh, yeah. It's the most soothing That's... thing on earth. I don't know what it is. It also creates a lot of babies. But <laughs> it is a great, a great thing to do. And and water really does help you if you're down. And I, had a, I, I go down to the water's edge. I say, let's go for our ride to the dock or, or wherever we go. Because I live, you know, right on the water. But I can't go like a day or two where I have to go and sit for at least like 10 minutes and not talk, not do anything. Just sit and stare at the water. And it just makes me feel so good. I notice my, my little dog, my little doxy, my dox sound. He, if he gets like over, you know, hyper or just annoying and down and nothing, he doesn't like anything we're doing. I put him in the car, we put him in the car and we drive down and we sit there and we let him look out the the window and watch all the people down at the beach and what's going on and he takes in that air and and looks around and walks around and he comes home and he's a new man so it even acts on the animal works on the animals so you know there's something to it so what we're saying to you in a nutshell don't lock yourself up inside with these technical things go outside and be with nature at least once a day and you will feel much better about life in general. And things will work out better for you, too. Absolutely. You'll be able to think better. Yeah, by the way, yep. these, these little beasts on our planet, um, sometimes they're more connected to it than we are. Uh, sometimes we have to pay attention to what the, what the beasts around us are doing. Um, that's true, especially if you watch birds. Birds are an amazing way to um, kind of tell what's going on around you. And um, they'll, they'll, they'll show you weather patterns. They'll show you wind patterns. They'll show you when there are predators. Uh, again, it's, this is really important. Look, you and I have spent a lot of years, Chris, doing uh, some pretty wild, exotic topics and things that we classify as the paranormal. And um, in framing all of that, it's important to remember that we also need to connect with our humanity with having, I guess, what you would call some sort of normalcy in life and being able to get back into a place of um, inner peace and connection because, let's face it, some of the stuff that you and I have talked about, we've explored, we've experienced, this stuff, this stuff will make you crazy. And yet, yeah. somehow, I find that people who have these exceptional experiences also tend to be somewhat balanced they understand the necessity to stay balanced, and that's really important for anybody who's listening to these shows to do so. <clears throat> kind of spent a little bit of time on that subject, but I think it's important. I, I, I just wish that... Uh, I, I don't wish that any, everybody could have a paranormal experience that's frightened the living hell out of them. I don't. But I just wish that everyone at some point in their life, was able to look, and I'm going to segue this way into to something else, uh, a different dimension, 
which is what I think a lot of the paranormal experiences are, yeah. is that we find ourselves somehow in another dimension or another time or another another link to our own dimension that somebody is finagling with or able to alter or, or grab us from. And all of it is connected. All of it to nature, all of it to, to life, all of it to the cosmos, all of it to everything. And I mean, everything is all the universes, all the solar systems, all the planets, the billions and billions, the endless, infinite, infinite number of all things that exist and all the dimensions that are part of it, obviously. Because if they weren't part of it, we wouldn't be experiencing it. It's just that we haven't conquered them. We can't interchange and exchange in back and forth with them. But it doesn't mean that the other people or the other life forms and the other whatever they are in different dimensions are not able to do it just because we don't. That's a human flaw. If we think if we can't do it, nobody else can. But all of this, if you just had one experience in your life, you would able to be able to grasp how precious life is and the experience that you're now living and the fact that you're human in this body at this time in this place probably has a reason and you should make sure you go out and find out what that is, meaning live life, pay attention to your surroundings and absorb it all. I don't want us to just immediately become robots that are being controlled by something else and be totally screwed out of the life form and the life existence and the life experience that you're supposed to be having. So in order, I think, to be shaken awake, if you have had experiences like you have and I have, we become aware of all of this. And I think we live much fuller, much more active and lively lives than people that just stay locked in and, and don't. You know what I mean? So I think it would be a good thing if everybody saw something they couldn't explain, didn't know what to do about it, and it scared the living daylights out of them because it might make them snap awake. And that's what I think a lot of the problem Well, is. I think a lot of that goes into um, re-embracing a sense of wonder I think most people have had some sort of experience on some level. Yeah, I, I've read articles repeatedly about what we experience as children. Um, and, and one of them was an article I read recently, and I don't have it in front of me, that had to do with children who experience having so-called imaginary friends, children who experience, let's say, the small creatures, uh, gnomes, elves, pixies, fairies, um, yeah. And the more I've engaged with people in different communities, um, I've come to realize that those experiences are profound and they're real. There's a couple of people that I talk to on a regular basis who have shared stories about the fae, which are the, the, the fairies, and then um, nature spirits, and even gnomes and elves and things like that, small creatures, creatures that live secluded away from humanity, creatures that could be extra dimensional perhaps or creatures that exist in nature as part of sort of a separate creation from us but it's very apparent that children experience reality on a different level than we do once we get past i'll say the age of five to seven when um when we start to become uh, so-called educated when our frame of references begin to harden um Many ET experiencers, their earliest experiences are their most memorable. I would say in my case that's true as well. Um, anywhere from the age of three up to a, probably about the age of seven is when people seem to have access to some of their, their memories about early experiences. And that's always struck me as the fact that we aren't preconditioned yet. We have a sense of wonder. And yeah, some of the stuff's dark, some of it's uh, scary and horrible, but that's the universe that we live in. And so, you know, I, I would say to people who are skeptics, be skeptical, but understand that there are things 
that you do not understand, that you cannot explain inside of conventional understanding, and that science itself actually tells you this. You know, people who have studied quantum physics, um, things like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, understand that even our own scientists understand that the further out they go and the further into the submolecular they go, they have a hard time explaining certain components of our so-called reality. Oh, absolutely. And, and we as a, a species know very little science, period. We're just starting to climb that, that ladder. And there's so much that we don't know, far more that we don't know than we do know. And as we start to climb, real, we realize what we thought was the way or the way it would be or is not so. So we, we're just starting to learn, you know, what the, it's all about, how it works, the, the actual physics of it. Is the physics same as you expand or does it change? All that we're just finally starting to deal with. And the thing about the children you know, we all have heard that, that, you know, children are more open to seeing spirits or um, having um, a psychic ability. They might say to you, that person over there, you know, lives down the street or his name is Joe and they never saw him before or something. Uh, uh, reincarnation with children, they have memories that they shouldn't possibly have. Oh, yeah. The question is, and I think it's that we all are born with the ability to float among these dimensions that we get closed down yes for us by our learning and teaching and we become hardwired just to live in this reality here and and not advance there anymore and i think we all have that ability as you said to like age five or six and that um psychics and people that do have still this wonderful ability to float among all this dimensional stuff and be able to see and deal with other things that we can. I think that they didn't just get closed off. For some reason, they were able to stay open and keep that open, and that's how they do it. And, I, you know, of course, we probably all could, but we, we don't. We, we hardwired down to just one dimension and one, one way and one time. And, and, you know, on this planet, and that's fine, too, because, you know, that's what we are supposed to be doing. But all of it is just fascinating. The whole thing is you have to open your mind and know it's all there. Whether you like it or not, it's all there. We just can't figure it out. And it kind of takes the real horror out of it. If you understand it's all there, it's all always been there, all those dimensions and things that people... It's probably been with us from the beginning of the beginning, and we just don't know how to transition in between them or, or um, deal with it yet. doesn't mean that we won't somewhere down the line, but we don't now. Now, that, I had an experience which was, took a lot out of me, the whole thing. The Two Sisters article I wrote about the real-time abductees, abductees the older sisters that had incredible experience. And they had, when I first heard the whole thing, I said, I don't, you know, I don't know, I don't think I can even grasp this until other friends of mine, peers of mine that are very bright said to me, wait, you know, you're not, you're not looking at this right. This is just a clash of dimensions that's happening in this case where all these dimensions came together in protection of this one woman, for whatever reason, she was being protected, and that's what it is. And that we don't understand that a lot of this stuff is just dimensional, not, not you know, a horror fantasy, not a, 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 a horrible thing, not a ghost story. It's dimensional and all about the energy of beings and blah, blah, blah. In other words, <laughs> there are so many things going on at the same time that we're not aware of, because we are right. fully just conscious in our own dimension doing our own thing. But other things around us are also there with us, maybe watching us. We all know we've had a 
parent or a grandparent or a sister or a child or something that passed that we feel with us all the time. That's because they're with us probably a lot of the time. Their energy is able to come and watch and be and oversee us and then go back to where their energy is now. Well, in that case with those two sisters, that's exactly what happened. I don't want to explain the whole thing now. But, you know, a woman had a terrible experience being tried, uh, trying to be abducted and which thought it was all over with. The creature that abducted her showed up again and was standing behind her chair <laughs> while she was reading a book in her bedroom. And so did her dead relatives appear, the spirits. And the grand, and they were all in the room at the same time. This woman was almost having a heart attack viewing all this. And her grandfather's spirit engaged this creature standing behind her chair and kept tell, telling the woman, don't look at it, don't look at it, as he engaged it and kind of told it, you know, gave it its walking papers. You're not taking her anymore. This is over. Take a powder. No more. And the woman... Her husband came in and walked into the scene, so she had a witness. And the, the husband actually saw the whole thing. And then she was in her son's house. The son came running in. It was a big free-for-all. And the long and the short of it is they watched as all these dimensions were in the same place at the same time. And they were able to view it. And that's what happened that, that night. It made a lot more sense, Randy, when you looked at it that way. I, I kind of suspect that we live in a sliver of a reality stream that's multidimensional, multi-chronological, I guess, um, multiple timelines. Um, we ourselves are likely multidimensional beings in terms of existence on many levels at once that we're not aware of. Um, certain psychic experiences seem to indicate that. Even our own dream state seems to indicate that. The fact that we uh, su supposedly go to bed at night, well, the body needs rest, but there's a part of us that does not sleep. Where does it go? What does it do? And a lot of people have tapped into this using many different modalities. Um, obviously, you know, people who have studied remote viewing, people who have done lucid dreaming, have been able to document being able to wake up in a dream state and wander through uh, dream scenarios. Is that any less real than what we call reality? Just because I can get up in the morning and touch something, does that make that more real than the reality that I walk through in, in, in a so-called dream state? And the answer is that we are multidimensional beings living in a multi-multidimensional, what some people have called the omniverse, the multiverse. Um, we have the ability to experience things on multiple levels. We simply don't have the capacity at this present time to experience them consciously yet. But I, I, think, I think humanity is going in that direction. I mean, some people call it ascension. Um, uh, a conscious consciousness awakening, uh, whatever you want to call it. I think humanity is arcing in that direction. It's just been very slow, but I also see the uptick even in my own lifetime. Yeah, yep, I, I, I do too, for some. And then there are, and, and I say this, I say this, and I don't mean to be mean about it, for some, but not for the many. I think there are still many or most human beings walking around with their head in a cloud, zipped closed tight. <laughs> they don't want... I would have used a less want, genteel term myself, but... Come on. They, yeah. They, yeah, they um, really have it stuck up there, and <laughs> they have no intentions of pulling it out. No. <laughs> and, and that's fine, because I think that's what their energy of their soul needs right now. They can't handle anymore. The experience that they're living on this planet now seems to be all they can handle. And mm -hmm. that's fine. We shouldn't be judgy or anything like that. They need to deal then with what they're dealing with because obviously that's all they can handle on their plate. 
and what they're supposed to be handling on their plate. Otherwise, they're going to come back and, I believe, go around and around and around till till they can move forward. And then there are others that are at a different level, and they they open to all these ideas and uh, philosophies, let's call it, and and understand that yeah, they, these things are all very possible. And then you have the whole question of the spirit of ghosts, but I, I call it the spirit, the energy of what you once were as a living being, is a human form, now is something else. And I am a true believer that our soul leaves and takes maybe not only another form, but maybe many different forms. Maybe it can split and go in five different directions at once. But part of it will be with those we left behind if we think we are needed. And I say that because my mother um, died uh, 10, 12 years ago, and she is around often. And it's always to guide, warn us. She's in a dream with us, and to, I'm saying us as my sisters and brothers, to, to give us messages and tell us things. And often what comes up in the dream, or if we have an actual sighting of our mother, when something's going in on, on in our life, and you might, I, I have had it where I saw my mother for a split second standing with me in a situation that was going on that I knew what I had to do. I knew that the situation was going to go sour or south and that I had to, you know, deal with something very ugly. And each time that's exactly what happened and I was able to deal with it. The fact that her energy stays with us is clear. It's not that we're all crazy with this big family of crazy people. We're not. But we all share the the attachment of that part of my mother right. that comes to be protective over us still. And we have that. I have lost many people in my life, and I have felt many of them with me and around me all the time. And once I, I, I went to a psychic not to long ago and she laughed and said to me you realize you have more dead people around you than you have living people <laughs> i thought that was the yeah, strangest that's... thing but it just happens to be well, my path what happened so that is there and we're all gonna go there and we will probably split in many different pieces our energy that is us and do amazing things that we can't even begin to understand at this level if you look at the native people, and, I, and this is true in any culture on any continent on the planet, there is a reverence. Even uh, rituals built around the ancestral lines of people. The connection that goes backward, and I'll even say forward, through what we call our, our, our genetics, our, our ancestral lines, it's funny because years ago when I was studying Hebrew, I just got it, discovered a Hebrew root word that was connected to the word translated ultimately in English through about five different stems of language as being um, generations that flowed forward and backward. In other words, the word itself embraced a completed circle of past and future generations. So... It leads me to believe that we are very connected in ways we don't understand that um, we continue a circle. And that circle is part of our beingness that connects us to previous generations and future generations. You know, I, this is this gets into some of the multidimensional stuff as well. But... You know, the ancient ancestor worship of, of indigenous people was kind of a hallmark of what they understood about their own roots and their own futures. They were, and if humanity got a hold of this concept, we would stop all of this negative shit that we're doing. We would be more circumspect about the kind of world that we're leaving for our future generations in terms of even our own well-being, because if we're that connected, that sort of tells you that we're not making a very good place for ourselves or for our future generations, which in fact are us. 
and 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 human beings need to go back to those traditional roots a little bit and 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 begin to live consciously according to some principles that kind of negate this ultra consumerism that we're doing um the continued support for the military operations that our government is employing i mean you know some of these people are psychopaths but i think a lot of it is just unthinking people you know this is part of the pulse of awakening the planet is to make us aware of all of these things that are resonating inside of us from what we talked about in the first part of the program chris and you know we didn't map any of this out tonight this is just an organic conversation so it's going where it's going but in talking about doing things like grounding getting connected to the planet getting connected to each other breaking off some of the um some of the technological hooks that are getting into us and then connecting back into um the ancestral lines of 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 our humanness all of these things then stream into the paranormal as well because there's something out there that's trying to tell us stories and we're not getting it it it's it's the the, the truth that and the simple fact of this planet is a is a world of chaos that's the only word i can put on it it's chaotic, it's unbalanced, it's confusing, it's plain crazy. We have, you know, people that are on TV because they weigh 600 pounds, eating 9,000 calories a day, which I don't even know where they get the money for that. And then we have <laughs> children dying all over like Africa, even in our own country, there are places of terrible poverty. And there's no, and, and, and you look at this and go, what are we, crazy? Are we all nuts? We have tremendous farmland that the farmers have been paid not to farm. And then I'll go back and say, and millions of people dying in, you know, turd infested streets, laying there like skeletons, you know. And you look at this world and you say, this is, you know, crazy. So this planet is the planet of chaos, confusion, and unbalance. And I do believe the energy that is each and every one of us is here, maybe by choice. I don't know about that yet. But we are here living this human life for a damn reason, and that's to come in and look at the chaos, the confusion, the unbalance, the the the. the beauty of the planet and the ugliness of it all at the same time and say, wow, this could be done a lot better or, you know, I, I, I don't know what to make of all this, but the thing of it is all, it's a lesson. So the only person you're hurting, if you're a human, living a human experience at this point in time, by shutting down and not going and paying close attention to everything that happens around you and what's going on in this world and just staying with uh, your pal Kathy in, in, uh, on Facebook or Instagram taking selfies. And I see some girls put up maybe 5,000 selfies of themselves on one page. <laughs> if that's how you're spending your time, your trip here was a waste, but don't worry about it. You'll be right back. And maybe next time it won't be as easy. You won't be able to obtain a computer because you'll be dig, dig, you know, digging in the street for an old potato to eat because you didn't pay attention the first time you went around. So do yourself a favor. And for your mortal or immortal soul, go out and pay attention to this crazy world that we're all living in and try to do something good or make the best of it or at least absorb it all. Because the next time around, you're going to need the information that you obtained living your human form life on this planet with you for your next road trip out there, whatever that might be. Yeah. And, and, and I truly believe this. So the only one you're hurting by living in a small little capsule with your head firmly planted up some Facebook butt is that you are hurting yourself. So, you know, turn off the damn stuff and go out there and live. Look at the situation. Before you vote, think it out. 
look at been, what's been happening around you. Has it been really good for the last amount of years or really going in the toilet? Do you want change or you want more of the same? These are things you have to think out, not be told by your friend or by some you know organization that you like to be a part of because it's cool. Think or the media. Or the, or the political or parties. The um, you or know. some jackass that's right. Supposed to be a newscaster, not telling you what to think, but just tell you what's going on in the world. They don't do that. They tell you what to think. Learn how to think for yourself and understand it's your soul. It's your damn soul that you're fighting for. And once you got that, believe me, lights go on. You start to think. That's what I think this planet is for. This is your, one of your biggest tests, my friend. What you do on Planet Chaos and how you work it and do you always do the right thing? <laughs> yeah. Are you a kind, good soul? Do you do nice things? Do, do you do right by your family and your friends? Or are you a son of a bitch? And I don't have to tell you, you know, where this is going. What you do and how you do it on this particular planet is going to really lay out the road work for you for, for what's ahead. And believe me, it's not a one-time time event. There is a what's ahead. That's right. So think that when, you know, you do something horrible to somebody. <laughs> you know, this is, um, I've come to accept that this is probably some, some sort of testing grounds for souls. Um, we have people on all different levels, including... Without question. Some entities that I, I question that they're human, except perhaps in appearance, and even that can be kind of questioned anymore talking about your 400 pound overeaters um but the bottom line is what, what we're talking about is conscious living it's living with a deliberate intent to get up each day and first do something good for yourself and then go do something good for other people for the world to live in a constant state of consciously being aware first of being alive and what that entails and what what a privilege it is, you know, and an, an understanding that, you know, we elevate the planet energetically by our best thoughts, intentions, and actions, and by doing that, they can be magnified and amplified, which I see a lot of people trying to do right now, and hopefully, you know, we can just kind of lift that up. Um, we have limited lifespans. We do what we can while we're here. Ultimately, when we exit the planet, we're going to take with us the experiences. Um, I always think of that. This will sound kind of corny and hokey, but I always think of the, the last song that the Beatles ever recorded. It's the last song at the end of Abbey Road that says, in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. And if you could have famous last words, that'd probably be a great one. It's just, yeah. you know people don't understand love anymore because people are just you know that's that's probably one of the most distorted things of all that, oh, that absolutely um we've well, mistaken right. it for lust and sex and yep and no bonding they don't understand bonding phony and, emotions you know yeah. the hallmark yeah. card mentality now loves loves an action it's a verb it's something you do and it's something that comes from deep inside of you, which is the soul-spirit connection. Yep. Wow. We really got on our soapboxes, didn't we? Yeah, well, but it, it's, tr <laughs> it, it's the absolute truth. And you don't hear this kind of stuff anymore because it's not cool. It's not cool to talk about that kind of thing. Well, you know what? You know, if that's what you want to do is go through life being cool, fine. But remember, you learned nothing, you did nothing, you, you know, you became nothing, but you were cool. And see how long that, what that's going to get you in the long run. You know, it's, it's not going to work out for you. Just like if you have a gift, don't be afraid of it. Go use it. Go do it. Go make it. Don't yeah. paint it. Yeah. Take a pitch. Whatever your thing is, sing, uh, play the violin, uh, guitar, whatever it is. You can build things. You can design things. Give it your best. Do it. And if somebody gives you a hard time or your road is rocky, so what? Do it anyway. The worst thing in life is if the worst thing in life is being told no or it didn't work out, my answer to that is, well, so what? I've heard no a lot of times. It's not going to stop me. You just keep go doing it someplace else or with someone else or do it just because you love to do it. But don't ever be stopped. 
and always, always treasure your gifts and use them and do them. And, you know, the luckiest person on the world, in the world is someone that can go through life doing what they love and, and being able to, you know, make a living out of it or, you know, keep a roof over their head while doing it. Exactly. That, that's a lucky person. Yeah. But um, these all things you, you need to think about. You, you can't, you just can't go with the flow. You're not a little sheep. You're a human. You have free will. You have you're a, a good working brain. You have choice. And use all of it. Use all of it. Be a total individual. You're not a part of a machine. You are a human. And humans are individual, unique, and wonderful creatures. So do your thing. And as far as the creatures that visit us, I think they are doing the same thing we are, just from a different place, a different aspects, a different level. Maybe they're up the ladder one more than we are. And they come and their job is to view and watch us or experiment with us, whatever. But it's all part of this big cycle of life, this big cycle of energy that we're all part of. And um, the best thing you can do is live the fullest you can. And each Absolutely. time, yeah. in every place, the same thing goes. So, you know, it, it, it's interesting. And, and also humans, remember, you're a human species doing a human experience on this planet. And an alien or a beast species or being from somewhere else, a different dimension, a different universe, a different just even solar system and a different galaxy in this universe they are what they are, and they're doing their thing the way they're supposed to do it, and so on and so forth. And that, if you can grasp that, then you kind of get it, that we're all doing our own thing because it's what we're supposed to do, and that all of us are part of this big ball of something that we don't understand, but it works because we all exist. Well, we think we do, and that's enough. <laughs> and and And... The, that's what's going on. It kind of sorted itself out for me. I just did wish it would, would for everybody. And I damn well know if I do something mean to you, Randy, I'm going to pay for it somewhere. So I'm not going to do it. Even if people do mean things to you, to us, be the better person and always do the right thing, too. Boy, will your soul appreciate that down the line. Yeah, and, you know, along those lines, Chris... Um I guess it's because, you know, you and I have lived a certain number of years, experienced things, and we kind of have, you and I have kind of shared a lot of things over the years in terms of experiences and viewpoints. Um, but the end game to all of this is really in sharing what we've shared, <clears throat> because some of this is dark, some of it's deep, some of it's personal, is to just put it out there that the uncommon is also the light that gets shown in the corner of our existence. These weird experiences, some of them horrible, some of them not, are are just shades and shadows of the reality that we live in. When you talk about planet chaos, well, there are places where the planet isn't chaotic. And there are places on this planet where things are, well, not so normal. You know, there's energetic places. There are places where there's a lot of paranormal going on. And there are other places where, I don't know, I mean, it it seems weird to me. And, and I wanted to kind of go into um, some of this with you in this interview uh, to talk a little bit about the subject that originally, probably five years ago, uh, kind of pulled us into each other's orbit, which is... Of the work that you've done with the, the with the real timers, because <clears throat> most of my listeners probably know this. People who pick these shows up occasionally may not know this is a rather unique work that Chris has put out over the years. Not many people have talked about um, UFO ET abduction scenarios from quite the perspective that's been portrayed in the work of um, Chris's chronicling of the real timers. And, Chris, I know that, that one of your hopes is that eventually a lot of this is going to get put into a more 
permanent format, but you do have um, articles on your website, and one of them right now is the one that you put out, Abduction Questions and Answers by Real-Time Abductees. We've talked about this um, over the course of several of our, our conversations together. Um, the real-timers, um, let's face it, most of these people are um, older. They're obviously suffering health problems. Is there going to be a legacy that comes from both your work in talking and interrelating with the real-timers and attempting to bring to the surface some sort of accounting of what these people individually and collectively are saying to humanity? Oh, God, that's that was a good a, question. I know it was a detailed question. You. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that is. I don't even know where to start with that. Um, I will tell you that the real-time abductees, which are everyday good people with, you know, going about the, their daily routine, uh, you know, not exactly big paranormal buffs or anything like that, that just find themselves in a spot. They put out their trash late at night. They're driving home from work. They're walking across a deserted parking lot. Whatever it might be, they provide the opportunity where they are taken by some type of being. They're not, they're not sure what it is. We say aliens. Some of them think it's advanced humans. Some of it think it's, they don't know. But they are taken against their will and then go about having a period of lost time and, like, say, three or four hours, find themselves returned, usually not where they were taken, sometimes really far away, sometimes mm -hmm. in somebody else's clothing, uh, sometimes with their clothes on backwards or they're fine. But they find themselves then coming awake somewhere they're not familiar with, sick, they're always vomiting, uh, running a fever, don't feel good, confused, and have to find their way home. And then they usually are sick for a few weeks and they have flash memories only. As they age, the memories become a little bit more clear of what took place. And they can remember just, you know, other creatures with them or trying to communicate with them or looking at them. Nothing terribly painful like, you know, no anal stuff like that. Nobody ever remembers that or anything. They obviously have their memories wiped, and there's a lot of memory of green light, green rays or green light, bright white light, and things like that. These people then go through this time after time after time in their lifetimes and uh, have a great problem with it because each time they come back, they are altered physically, meaning they are very burned. They have problems with their necks, with their spinal spinal column, with their shoulders, uh, terrible growths on their bones. Oh, I'm trying to think. A d destruction of their, their bones. Where uh, skin problems, um, scales. Skin problems. Uh, I mean, skin problems, like big patches of yeah. like reptiles. Almost skin. reptilian like. Skin. Right, yeah. right. Uh, their eye color has changed. They cannot tolerate the light, the, the sun or light. They have to be in darkness or covered dark sunglasses, tinted car windows. And their IQ points increase as they have these things happen to them, which is good for them because they're able to quickly educate themselves and hold jobs during their lifetime where they were able to make the money needed to form uh, living conditions that protect themselves better from having these things happen to them so they can afford security things or have, uh, housing where they can bring in relatives and friends to live with them so they're not alone, yada, yada, yada. That's a New York term, by the way. Uh, <laughs> that um, helps protect them. They are very unusual people, and they have very unusual opinions. And they then decided to work with me and I started to write about them, and they tried to warn mankind about lots of things, including about not thinking that this is fun and to protect yourself from the unknown. You shouldn't go rushing into it. You shouldn't go looking for it because you don't know what you're dealing with. And um, 
they're definitely against all the technology because they feel we are being just forced into being connected and controlled totally by like a big brother type scenario where the world's uh, population will become totally controlled, humanity will be lost, and this whole experience of being a human will be bygone. They uh, see lots of things very negative for the future, including devastation by way of uh, weather manipulation and changes to the cycles of the earth for profit and reasons that tend more to head towards a one world government than the good of human, uh, humanity that will end up in the total destruction of the world, like trying to wipe out the population of Africa and the Middle East by making the climate so that life can't be supported there. And, they, and instead, causing such a terrible change in Mother Nature that our cycles on the planet are altered to the point that we end up, you know, destroying the earth. Um, they, they talk about all these things, except for one thing. No one ever showed any interest in this group of m very interesting, very smart people that were willing to come out of the shadows and share what they've been through and what they've learned and what they know by society. I would write about these people and say any universe or uh, university or um, scientific group or even the government that would be interested in interviewing or talking to them to do some serious research, they would do it. We heard nothing. No one wanted any part of them. They would say we had tremendous experiences. We'd love to talk about it. And no one would ask them not one question. No one would e email me anything. Didn't want to know anything that these people had to say. So eventually the, they watched all this. They watched everything I wrote. They wanted to see all the answers. It was embarrassing for me. I could not get any reaction from anyone in our society. They just didn't want to hear it from these people. They wanted to hear the little horror Star Wars type deal crap that's all fraudulent and ridiculous that's out there in, in, in the world of the paranormal and not what this more realistic, hard evidence type people with the wounds on their bodies to prove what they say had to say or, or anything to do with them at all. So eventually they said, you know what? Screw them all. We know what we know. We know what we've been told. We did our job. We were told to share it. We shared it. There's no interest, no response. Fine. We're going to guard ourselves. We're going to take care of ourselves. We're going to, you know, do all we can to protect ourselves. And the rest of you, you're on your own. And, you know, we, we don't really care. It's not our job to educate you. We offered. We really don't care what you think or don't think at this point. And I was then cut off, basically. So I wrote the last two articles I had, The Two Sisters, which is a hell of an article, about a, uh, a, the two older sisters that were able to fight off an attack, but not really because they had an awful situation afterwards. It's all in that article. And then um, I wrote an article about an abductee that did get asked and was asked questions by his abductors about humans, what the aliens questioned him about, which I thought was interesting and definitely not the kind of stuff that you would think. It was, you know, really some strange stuff. And that article, I got like heat mail about, Randy. Heat mail for what that questions article contained. Now explain that to me. No, well, there is a deny. There is um, a denial complex uh, within the mainstream of humanity over this subject. And then... There's an open hostility rejection on the part of what you call, well, the universities, the institutions, the governments. I mean, at the highest levels of these institutions, they know about some of this. Uh, some of it they've been manipulating, some of it they've been exploiting, and some of it they've actually been through what are known as uh, no lab abductions, been uh, perpetrating a fraud 
on us by impersonating and simulating abductions as well. And so, you know, humanity as a whole has no context into, fit, into which to fit any of this, nor do they have the conceptual ability right now, I think, to deal with the immenseness of what we're talking about here. You know, the, the sadness to me is to see this work pass into uh, the sea of forgetfulness, so to speak. I, as, and this was originally why I contacted you years ago, why we've had so many conversations, why we keep bringing this up, because I think it's really important to keep putting this out there so that people know that there have been those in our own race who, at horrible cost to themselves, have experienced these events, and that these beings, despite you know what we don't understand about how they're able to take us, why they're able to take us, also seem to not be... Well, they, they frankly seem a bit baffled by the whole condition of the human race on, on a number of levels. I mean, <clears throat> my sense of it in, in contact experiences was they were truly perplexed by our emotions. They were bewildered by exhibits of anger or um, even sorrow or fear to a certain degree, although they intellectually seem to understand emotions. They don't understand what that means to us. They right. clearly... They right. They can't feel it. They know we do, but they can't, so they don't get it. So in, in, in all of this, we seem to have um, very brilliant, advanced civilizations, yet there's a part of them that doesn't comprehend something that's rather unique to us. If it's not unique, it's certainly extremely rare in terms of uh, life forms that populate the, the, the omniverse, universe, metaverse, whatever you want to call it. They also did not understand the concept of, of family or um, parents. Or the, the one question, if I, I remember correctly, was, why do only two people like raise the children like mm -hmm. they might have five kids or something why is there only two adults involved in this or like a single parent concept was totally confusing to them because obviously they had more of a, like insect type probably um civilization thing going on where you had the babies or the reproductions brought forth by maybe the reproducing group and then the child rearing. Sure, it's more like a colony. People raised the kids like a colony. Yeah. There were not family units, and they didn't get the family unit at all, not at all. And they also didn't get the whole why we have all this food and energy on the planet and some of us, is the question I ask in the same question, why some of us have so much food that we're throwing it out. I mean, look what goes out of each restaurant every day that isn't consumed that we throw out. And then we have these people starving all over the world and other places. They don't get that because don't forget, they don't look at us as a national separation in units. They look at us as one unit, this planet, and this is how they're running it. You know, are these people all crazy? And then the other question I remember was the why are we self killing? And the guy, the the guy didn't understand what he was being asked, and he kept the the alien kept putting the image of him. Why are you self killing? And he couldn't. He says, "Well, we have wars, and the, and the being would no, no. We know you're violent." and that you kill each other in these big, you know, feuds. But why are you, in the, you know, each of you self-killing? And then he did show him, like homeless people, oh, smoking, a, a guy covered in smoke, smoking, um, a very big fat person, um, drugs, alcohol, that kind of stuff, self-killing. Why do we do things to kill our own bodies? That was completely confusing to them. And when you think about these things, 
These are things that we wouldn't think they would ask us, that if you think about it for a minute, would be extremely confusing to a different species. So they don't understand love, families, our compulsions to do the things that we do, our violence, our inability to take care of the life forms that are on the planet, all those things. So we are looked at with very strange eyes, which is probably why they come and, and, and examine and watch us. Plus, I think we have biological material that they either lost the ability to make that they take or just happen to need because they're doing experimentation. But um, it's a whole interesting thing. And again, these creatures, these beings are doing what is the normal for where they come from, for the life forces that they've been given to live in the planet or the dimension, whatever it is that they come from, they're doing their thing. But they have the ability because of the advancement to watch us do ours. We just don't aren't able to reverse that because we're too primitive, but that it, it, it's not as like, um, Oh, it's not as supernatural and all that kind of horror crap to me. It's more very just scientific. That's what's going on. They are here doing their thing, examining us. They do theirs different. They obviously come from a whole different thing. I think they're probably from a bug-like society. We didn't, our evolution is from the mammals. That's what mm -hmm. they, yeah. can, they, their planet, they probably evolved from more of an insect type thing. And then I'm sure there's a reptilian type thing, dinosaur type thing that evolved into like a reptile type thing. There's all kinds, there's cloud people, I'm sure there's, water people, there's all kinds of, you know, beings all over from all different kinds of chemical combinations, but um, they are curious about us. And if you think about it, they ask some very interesting questions, questions that we can't answer for them. Well, it's questions we're not even asking, <laughs> questions we're not even asking about ourselves. You know, maybe, yeah. maybe this is the mirror that's placed in front of our face collectively that ask the hard questions that we now need to ask of ourselves, which yeah. is actually kind of the takeaway that I got out of this article that you posted, because I had a sense of finality while well, you communicated it. The sense of finality about this really was kind of the last article about the yeah. real timers. And yeah. that makes me sad because I feel like there was a, there's a whole lot more that needs to come to the conversation. You know, there's so much that... <laughs> Humanity has lost so much with our insensitivity, with our ignorance, our foolishness, our, 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 our trivialities of sages who have passed from the planet. I mean, think about the wise men that have come before us and how limited knowledge we have about them, the words and the deeds that they did. And I think humanity is impoverished every time we allow something like this to pass from our our. Our, our presence without fully reaching out and grabbing as much of it as we can. I mean, oh, uh, two words, Nikola Tesla. Mm -hmm. Look at what you did to him. And mm -hmm. do you rem can you imagine where would we be if we let that man just run full throttle and you know gave him what he needed to um, give him give us the the inventions and the knowledge that he obtained instead we shut down and actually starved him out so you know that's that's the problem well tesla actually said that he had interactions with other beings that gave him a lot of the technology yeah and uh, here again you know we may be cutting ourselves off from a, a, a source that would enable us to shortcut the, the grief and sorrow that this planet appear, apparently is going to have to go through before the collective race wakes up. Um, and I, I will tell you, and it's, it's, it's scary, it's sad to me, it's um, you know a, a warning that I have had to really give some thought to, is the retail, retail, <laughs> I don't know where that came from, the real-time, um, I, maybe I need to go shopping, the real-time abductees made it quite clear that they are preparing, preparing for 
the worst. They have um, abodes tucked away in different places in the country. They have cabins, you know, in in the woods and things like this. They have uh, put p- provisions in places. They have food stores and things locked away and ways to get to it. And one is moved closer to a place that they can get to with bicycles that has horses. and But they are ready for some severe, terrible things to happen that they think is going to be in their lifetime. Well, that's, that's scary. Be it Yellowstone blowing or us doing devastation to our own and, and to our, you know, our own selves or all this heart machinery and chemtrailing that's going on that I believe is being used to manipulate the, the planet where a lot of the dirty business that we need to clean up instead of like sending food, we're going to take and send death to parts of the world to, to wipe it out, to, to, to reset everything. They're trying to do this like reset to control the, the planet. Who? The powers that be that I think that really control this planet. Um, all this stuff they are warning against. Open your eyes and get ready because here it comes. And they would tell me over and over, tell these people they have to at least prepare like there's a hurricane coming at all times because there's a, a storm is going to come. And it may be like one they've never seen before, like the strange sandy storm we had here. Yeah. That was just an odd wall storm. That that may be a, a thing of the a future that's commonplace. But you have to have food stores, be able to keep yourself warm, have water, you know, all the things, the essentials for at least like six or eight weeks, if you can, to ride out anything that's coming this way, because you're going to be on your own. And they take it seriously. They put it in action. Each of them has plans. So, you know, that's the only thing I can tell everybody. I would take it seriously because they seem to know a lot more than I do about what's, you know, coming. And they, this election, they feel it's very important. That big change is definitely needed. And if not, we're, we're going to be headed down a very bad road. So all I can do is report it. I'm the messenger in this deal, and I tried my best. But uh, people, they just weren't going to have it. So what can I say? The only thing I did get was some hate. Some hate, cold names insulted. So, you know, that, that doesn't uh, really make you want to get out there and keep putting the message out when that's the, the, what you get back. So they told me that was, you know, I'm done. There's not going to be any more uh, insight coming from them that I can see in, in any future because they uh, are angry, quite frankly. Well, you know, we have to do two things. We have to prepare for the worst and work for the better. I I think whatever the fate of humanity is right now, it's largely in our hands. I'm not a fatalist. And I also don't believe in this wrathful God theory either. Um, Ultimately, whatever whatever, um, fates we entertain are going to be what we suffer. So we have to begin working on that. And so... You know, this is this is a two two pronged effort. Be prepared. It, it, that that statement, wait a minute, I got to go back to it. That God's wrath thing. This is what the intelligent force that may have developed all us, all of us human, the human race anyway, the human species, and I think it, probably every species that was developed out of this intelligent force, is it gave us something that we don't like free will and choice. So it's our free will and choice, and you just said it, what happens to this planet? So if we destroy it, and it fights back because the planet is a living thing of its own, and it takes and, you know, gives us storms that we can't survive, and uh, droughts we can't live get through, and volcano eruptions that are devastating, well, we can't 
you know, be blamed for a lot of that, but we can be blamed for a lot of the things that we are doing, like manipulating the weather and causing so much war and the starvation. The, 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 the man that had this conversation of sorts with this other species was shown farmland. He said it was like being flown low over the farmland of like upstate New York and Nebraska and everywhere, just empty farmland not being used with being asked the question why. And then again, shown all the starving babies with the big bloated stomachs and the ribs showing and the big googly eyes and asked why. And he said that he started to cry. He felt so bad about himself at what he was being shown. So we all have to understand, it's not leave, leave God or the intelligent creator out of this. This is our free will, will and our choice, what we do here as humans on this planet. And if you want to see what we're doing, be, be honest with yourself. Grow a pair and open your eyes and look. It's a damn sin. It's a shame. I know I'm ashamed. It's, it's not. We can do a lot better. The question is, not what God is going to say. or do. It's what are we going to do? When are we going to straighten out? When are we going to stop it? That's the question. Yep, that is the big question. So again, I would commend to listeners out there to go over to endlessjourney.blogspot.com. Um, just Google search Chris Holly, and it'll come up. And uh, while you can read this online, check out the article on the real timers and um, the message that goes with that. Chris, I got a story here. Um, I debated whether I was going to talk about this. Oh, uh, then I want to hear it. <laughs> Whenever you debate about it, I definitely want to hear it. <laughs> no, no. I was going through the April 2016, that's the current edition, of 40 and Times. Um, <clears throat> and I read this magazine because I'll, a lot of people that I've interviewed over the years write for 40 and Times. It's based on the work of Charles Fort, Charles, Charles Hoy Fort, who lived in the early part of the 20th century and chronicled anomalous um, very strange things that occurred and so it's kind of a journal of the paranormal but under the headline and I hate the headline and I, there's aspects to this article that I don't like a whole lot as well it is uh, entitled Alien Sex Fiends and I'll just I may mm -hmm. skip over parts of this but um, it, it goes Bridget Nielsen and the Lunaverse are part of the hybrid baby community, a group of women claiming they have offspring fathered by aliens who live with their, live with their fathers, the aliens. Sometimes when people write things. Fathered by aliens, the children who live with their fathers on spaceships. Former marketing executive Bridget, 27, from Sedona, Arizona, described being taken on board a spaceship. It was great, she said. It was an incredible, super primal sexual experience. There was a real freedom when we were really going for it. It was the best sex I ever had. Oh, she, Jesus. She lives... Come on. I know, I know. And this is why I was uncomfortable with the article. She lives in Arizona with her father, but claims to have regular contact with aliens and to have 10 hybrid children. They are not just taking our children. She said they are creating a hybrid race to better humanity. She claimed that many other woman, women might have had alien children without realizing it because they were taken in a dream state. <clears throat> Video game designer Aluna, 23, from Los Angeles, claims to have three alien babies. She spoke about her first experience. Quote, I was in a classroom setting with other humans and all of a sudden... I'm sat next to this green reptilian creature, and immediately I'm so sexually turned on looking at this being. I was very surprised. We were, we were making love in front of everyone in the classroom. Everyone turned their attention to us. It sounds crazy, and people have asked if I'm off my meds, but this is really happening. Both women sketch drawings of what their hybrid children look like. 
Most display reptilian features with big black eyes, along with more human characteristics. The two women said their sexual encounters were real intercourse. Conceptions can also happen through artificial insemination, but only to people who on some level, quote, want to be taken. Both say they have struggled in the, quote, real world because of their alien encounters. Bridget said, I don't really have normal relationships anymore. This has become my normal. I know people who are married or have boyfriends, and when they tell it, it then goes badly for them. There's a sadness because you can't be with them, quote, the uh, parentheses, the hybrid children. Members of the Hybrid Baby Society hope to find a place far from the city to live together where the children will be safe to visit. Um, this is from the Metro, Metro Daily Mail, 21st of January, 2016. And um, the, there's photographs. I'll post this up when I put this show out. I, these are seemingly very attractive, normal-looking young women. And I wanted to get your take on the article because there's a serious side to this. This is not it. This just tell me what you think. This feels to me like tabloid all over it. I I think they are full of shit. And that I'm not <laughs> put it any nicer. And that this never happened to them. And shame on them, those SOBs, because there are many people all over this planet who have been taken and they have had their body fluids or eggs taken. And it's not like we do it. It's, I think, far more advanced, easier, and quicker. It's not a big, painful, terrible thing. But they are drained and their biological parts are used and taken, their eggs and their sperm. And yes, there are hybrid children. But this story about the lovemaking and the turned on and everything stick it up your, <laughs> your ignorant, like I said I, de- I debated and this is why this is why people yes. that really experience this stuff don't say a word exactly and get this guy you have fraudulent sh- fra- that's the hottest turd I've heard in a long time that thing's a steamer that's what I think of that and anybody that comes up with something like that you get taken my friend you're so damn frightened what you do remember Or during the experience, you're just praying your heart doesn't blow out of your chest. You're so frightened that you think you're going to have a massive heart attack and drop dead. You're not jumping on and humping an alien. So this nonsense is these two sick twists that got their names in the papers and their pictures. Good to them, freaks. I hope you're happy. But it's not the truth. And what it did do was insult and hurt and harm and cover up and destroy anything we can get to move forward on the subject of the things that actually do happen. And there are high-bred children. Yeah. And all the abductees I know all fear that that's something they're going to be shown. A few have been shown. And it was a terrible experience for them when they were shown a, a, a person, a being... That was not human, was not alien, was something else. These hybrids. And it it broke their heart because they knew that they were being shown it because it was part of them. It was their child, their offspring. And those um, uh, reports are always just about the same. They have very quick uh, encounters where they are shown these beings and the message is clear, this is yours, this is what happened, and that's it. Um, they don't go live up in the mountains. And coming from Sedona, Arizona, I'm not totally shocked that that's yeah, right. I, no, no offense. No, you know, Sedona's a great place, but give me a break. So anyway... Well, here's um, the thing about the story. When, we, you, when you deconstruct... It, it, go ahead. The, the, the people that do experience this deserve the respect from the rest of us to understand what an earth-shattering event this is. Now, I I wrote a story about it, Are They Mine? I don't know if you'd like to get into it or not, but it's about a very good friend who was sitting having lunch one day, he, a dinner, I think it was. He was working late, went to a corner 
a, a, to a strip mall where on the corner was this little favorite Chinese place with tables outside. It was still light. It was the summer. And uh, he went in and got his meal and was sitting down. And all of a sudden, he caught it and his vision was caught by these two young people standing there. And Randy, tell the rest of the story. Yeah, within about uh, a frame of, I don't know, five to ten seconds, two beings walked into view, um, communicated with me telepathically, and disappeared. And in that brief flash moment, I was at least able to mentally capture the image of these two beings. Young beings. Young beings. And those drawings and that article are on Chris Holly's website. And they're also and posted they, at offplanetradio.com as well. So you can go over and look at that. Um, we talked about this, you know, Chris, Chris and I have talked about this in private. I made the decision to put it out. I never stated for the record that I thought they were mine. I have to conclude, though that when those two beings appeared to me, they were communicating something. And the something was a sense of familiarity that was communicated by the male who connected with me telepathically and basically said, how are you? In my native tongue, inside my head. That quick encounter was a familiarity that you wouldn't get from a normal teenager to a stranger sitting at a cafe outside restaurant eating dinner. Um, no. The images which I drew within probably 90 minutes of the time it happened are pretty close to what I remember about them. Their mannerisms were strange. Um they were humanoid, they were humanesque, they were not human in the way that we would recognize human, and they disappeared far too quickly for a human to disappear. They appeared and reappeared, and all of this happened, I would say, in a time frame between 15 to 20 seconds, less than a, a third of a minute. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, you'd have to say, well, why would these two unusual... And as Randy described them, they were tall and very thin. They were not, they were tried to dress like uh, you know teenagers. They tried to they dress were, like yeah. They they right. really didn't. But they were a bit off. Yeah. And they were a bit off. Yeah. 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 It's strange. I mean, the clothing that I remember them wearing would not seem wasn't space. It wasn't space clothing, but it wasn't of the time and era that you would see teenagers wearing clothes like these. Everything about the whole experience was distorted, very strange. It has, even when I think back on it now, and it's, you know, this is difficult to do, but to think back on it, it was disturbing and it was surreal. And I have to tell you that it, for weeks it haunted me, and I had nowhere to go with this. I mean, Quite frankly, it's just not the kind of thing you have for a conversation over morning coffee. Right, right. And and, and you, you would have to, Randy also uh, described their eyes as overly large and their mm -hmm. pupils um, were like vertical, weren't they? Yeah, the, 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 the pupils, uh, like as I recall them, remember you're capturing details in very quick seconds, but that was that was yeah. very telling to me. It was something you notice. If right. there's one thing you're going to notice about somebody that intrudes into your space, it's going to be their eyes. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's where you look. And yes, they were, they were um, it's in the picture. Um, I would say they were vaguely reptilian. It's certainly... Uh, not the eyes that human beings have. Um, other tells were um, fully attached ear lobes. I would say ears that did not have lobes. Um, very elongated necks, protrusive foreheads. Uh, body proportions were off. Um, most human beings correspond to a golden ratio. These beings were just oddly out of symmetry somehow. 
And those are things that are very difficult to capture in a drawing when you're sketching from something you only saw for, you know, maybe 15 seconds. But the encounter itself has stayed with me. And, you know, because you, you and I talked about this, I felt encouraged to go ahead and say, okay, we put this out here. You know, I, I have no conclusions to this day. I'm not drawing them. There's a kind of an emotional place where you go with this that's, uh, well, you know, there's a vulnerability there. What I suspect is that, you know, these beings may not have even been in time, so to speak. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that I kind of understand about the encounters that I had was that we, you talked about the real timers. I'm talking about beings who view time as simply just another um, a signpost on the highway of, of the universe. So these, these, these beings could quite possibly have dropped in from not only just another place, but another time. And they could also have been <laughs> looking for Randy, an opportunity to hologram him down, these two kids to show him what was happening to him, what you know why he was going through past experiences right. of a little lost time or confusion that he didn't understand which happened which happened you know when i was a teenager right so th that's, there's that's an anomaly that you have to grapple with it's kind of like and, right. you know these are these are there are so many layers and levels to this and um there's a lot of people that I talk to that I never interview for various reasons. I have extensive conversations with people who are experiencers on numerous levels and of different things. And when I talk to them, there's a commonality that we sense that there's manipulations of time and space that occur. That memories, Absolutely. memories are manipulated. Um, one of the things that I'm noticing right now is people getting closer to um, end of life. People in their 60s, 70s, and 80s that are now having recall of events that happened in so-called missing years of their lives. And I, and, and I think a lot of that's happening because as we get older, well, maybe you can explain this better than I can, Chris. What, why is it that we seem to recapture memories at a certain point in our lives? I'll say after 40 as a random number. Well, I, I, I don't really know. I think well, part of it is that, well, in the human being, you know, you're, when your brain ages, it changes. Yeah. And a lot of the technology that might have been used to wipe out or remove the memories of when we were with these other people or during those times we uh, had experiences we can't easily recall uh, that is um, it, wear, it, it wears, wears off, off which yeah. is able to remember it yeah. and as the brain ages and changes like uh, with sight when you age you get more of a uh, tunnel vision and people always think it's you know they're all oh, getting old they need strong glasses actually it's your brain that is aging and changing the ability to see and we develop a tunnel vision when you get older and you're mid-60s on from the aging brain, not from the actual eye. Well, I think this is part of that too. That and it just wears off and the people become more relaxed and able to cope with it and the memories start to come back. And they um, possibly want to or are allowed to remember and deal with this before it is their time to leave this particular space and place. Yeah. So, you know, uh, that that's all probably the answer to it. Plus, I want to say the way Randy just solemnly explained what he dealt with, and it was a painful thing for him, not a pleasant one, is exactly how Everyone else that I believe truly was telling me a fact, something that really happened to them, that they saw, that they encountered, that they witnessed, tells it. You notice that he wasn't kicking up in the air and, and doing a jig and dancing around, you know, doing the can-can, flipping up his 
his skirt in the back over the fact that he had five or six alien children somewhere, or 12, or whatever that moron stated um, in that article. Let me, let me um, tie the loop on this article for a minute, and why I, I, why I read it, and why I was tempted to never read it. First off, for the 40 and Times people, you know, of all the articles you could have posted on this, you went for the most salacious material. These two girls are picture book models. Um, and Chris, you can't see the pictures. I'm looking at them right now. But both of these girls are like um, fresh faced, peach skinned girls, um, probably, you know, crystal licking New Agers from Sedona and L.A. And the only reason why I read it was I wanted to make a contrast here. The alternative media, once again, has gone the way of everything else. And they've turned what was serious research into serious subjects into total shit. I mean, just right. just the headline itself. And then what offended me the most is that, that you could treat this as an erotic experience. Um, that's, that's actually, and I am not a prude, this is actually kind of perverted in a way. Um, if you're turned on by lizards, well, you know, go for it. But transspeciesism doesn't turn me on. And again, they're showing pictures that they've sketched. The pictures look like they were taken out of cartoon books, comic books. Um, I'm not comfortable with this article. And I'm not comfortable giving it air, but at the same time, it was a contrast. And since you and I had agreed we were going to talk about this a little bit more, this article popped up in front of me today while I was reading at lunchtime. It was like it popped up in front of my eyes. And I'm like, this Bridget Nielsen has shown up at some conferences recently that I'm given to understand. I don't go to them anymore. But I have a sense this is some sort of government op, mind control system that they're sending these people out because, again... The goal is to discredit the authentic journalists and at the same time to kind of juice it up so that there's kind of like this smirky, smarmy kind of thing going on with a twinkle in their eyes going, oh, this is so great. This is wonderful. No, it's not. This this article's bullshit. And it's dangerous. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you why. I, I smell some Molly in that whole story, too. That's what I think the girls were into. If they, But I think they'll think it's just a made-up piece of crap. They pick two girls. You want to have your, you know, picture in the paper and blah, blah. Okay. It, it's just, a, as I said, it's a pile of hot steaming dung. That's what it is. But um, it's dangerous because you're going to have, I guarantee you, some person that's not completely in control of their mental, of, uh, in mental state. And they're going to think that sounds like something great to do. And they're going to go out and look and try to offer themselves up to, to something like this and end up with some human taking them and absolutely slaughtering them in a serial killer type thing and dumping them in the woods by a swamp or possibly some kind of interaction with an alien that just sees the opportunity to see some idiot out on the beach or isolated using a laser to attract them, a laser light. So this could end up in tragedy for somebody who thinks, oh, I want to get some of that sex. I want to go with them. I want to have alien babies and leave this place. I'm so unhappy. That kind of thing. Well, this is the same kind of... travesty. Same kind of thing that you have with people going out with Stephen Greer calling in ufos and we talked yeah. about this a long time ago and i Which actually drives me crazy talked to people that have done it and i'm kind of like appalled at them because i'm like what are you flipping crazy i mean yeah look intentionality being what it is we have encounters we have experiences you can be open to experiences i wouldn't go courting any of these experiences directly um, I don't know one abductee that doesn't do everything in their power exactly. not to have it happen again. Well, and many of not us fought against it. it. Many of us fought against it. Right. Um, and they say the ones that fought have the most severe uh, breaks, like in their skeleton and everything. Like, uh, there's an abductee I know well that has been told, why did you, you know, what happened to you in a terrible car crash? Why did you break your shoulder like that? It's all been, you know, broken and 
it grew back and it's not, wasn't set correctly. And that same person was told that their back had been broken, not once, but twice. And the person, no, my back was never broken. Oh yes, it was because they went and had all the C scans and x-rays and everything because they were complaining of terrible back pain. And with the well, when you broke your back, it didn't heal right. And now you have terrible pain. Well, that's what happens. I think when you fight is that they, or use they use ex- extensive force and then try to probably solder you. I don't know any other word. Solder the bones back together the best they can, so that they can return you. And when you return, you're sick and you're hurt and your back hurts, but you're able to function and it heals and and you just go through life and don't realize the extent of the damage done to you. Well, I think there's some unintended trauma as a result of being abducted, of being pulled into a craft, of having... And thrown back out, right. And then being thrown... Well, you remember the show we did a few years ago on the cattle mutilations, and I've long dropped. considered that that's they were dropped, basically. Yeah. Well, how many abductees have, have wound up, you know, bleeding and bruised and in and, and strange places yep. as a result of being dropped as well? You know, right. these these beings may either be negligent, careless... We're just totally unaware of the fact that relative to the planet we live in and the, the effects of what's called gravity on our bodies, even normal wear and tear over the course of a lifetime is pretty horrendous on us. And then you're put taking people and putting them through testing and, and, and culture taking and who knows what else is going on. Um, the females having eggs taken, males having... Um, seminal fluid taken uh, externally with, you know, another subject completely for another day, but, you know, having things placed that were basically designed to extract fluids from you. Um, right. All of these things are traumatic to the body. And, and the one real trauma abductee is a medical doctor, and she's stuck on the fact that she claims that all the abductees had their adrenal system mm-hmm. drained, yeah. that they want that ad- adrenal fluids, whatever, uh, 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 or, or, or cells or something, but that when she examined all the cases, she saw the results would result from someone that had their, that system somehow drained or altered or changed. So, yeah, all those things are happening to these people. Yeah, radiation and, burns. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and which is probably some of the skin things that you see. Um I'm pretty convinced that just the act of going onto these crafts, you're changing gravity as well, because these beings clearly live in a different um, gravitational system. So maybe uh, even that and being placed back in our own mm-hmm. gravity would snap and pull the skeleton enough to do damage. I yeah. mean, all these things are all possibilities. But it isn't something that you go out, tanked up on... Uh, you know, a a, a 40 or, you know, a six pack, get yourself loaded up and go on a beach and call to your attention to want to do because it's fun. So Greer and things that he has people doing is so dangerous and so irresponsible and so, and just awful. I, I just don't know what to say about it. I would never do that to people. Never. I would never subject to that type of danger. So, what can I say? Different strokes, yeah. different folks. But again, people, you all got free will. Don't be talked into something like that. Well, I, I suspect that the other side of this is that at least some of the ETs have hidden themselves from us for our protection. Um, I have that on pretty good authority. Uh, but at the same time, disclosure, so-called, is actually been ongoing for about 60 years, probably even longer, and it is speeding up. But humanity is really not ready for this experience yet. No, they reject it. They deny it. They turn it into a movie. They make it a Bigfoot television show that's so ridiculous that, you you know, say, no, you, you, not only would you not catch a Bigfoot with what you're doing, every bird and bear and little mo- pack of mice and in the forest would run away from it. You know, these ridiculous shows and everything. All of it destroys all the work that people are really doing to try to figure out all these unknowns 
because the public is not ready. If they were, they would demand to be done correctly. They would come and get the people that are really having these experiences and examine them and talk to them and deal with them and, and get the information. You know how much data is being lost? It's just terrible. It's being lost to MUFON, who doesn't compile data correctly and has no idea what the hell to do with it. You know, I, I love to know that TV show is hysterical. Where's uh, this Hangar 51? Isn't that what they call it? Hangar something like something. that. Yeah, it's myth. Well, it there there is no exist. hangar, folks. There's no building. It's a website that's poorly run. That nobody... With, and the stories you're shown... Are probably all made up. Well, they're composite written, stories. Or, Actually, yeah. somebody from MUFON has admitted this, and if I can find it, I'll post it. The stories themselves are composites of cases. Um, MUFON's taken the position that the statistical data that resides in their alleged databases, which, as I understand, they've turned over to, um, well, our friend... Um, Mr. Bigelow. Mr. Bigelow. Which um, is a private concern. Has now been siloed. It's yeah. been codiciled away from mainstream research. Meanwhile, uh, MUFON got a contract to basically put themselves behind putting out uh, a, a TV series based on composite cases, which just goes into the woo-woo factor once more. Right. Uh, they are no better than 40 in times for publishing the Alien Sex Fiends article, as far as I'm concerned. The paranormal community in general is a pile of dung at this point. Oh, and the terrible. F the few serious researchers that are out there are people like us that are just hanging on by our fingernails and, and frankly giving up. I, I've said repeatedly that, that outside of the things that you and I do and maybe a few other people, I'm sort of done with all of it, at least in terms of um, the general media. Uh, I hold out hopes I'm going to do some articles and possibly even write a book or something. But if I did that, again, who's going to publish it and who's going to buy it? Because you know damn well mainstream publishers won't pick it up and mainstream public won't read it. So this, these are the obstacles that we face, Chris, as we go forward in trying to bring out serious research. The real timers completely ignored by everybody. This is, you know, they're, they're basically going to, uh, I'm sorry, you know, we're all aging, we're all sick, and quite frankly, we're all going to go away and all of this is going to be lost in the dustbin lost of history forever. again. Yeah. Well, what I'm doing is I am so disgusted with the paranormal. And, and what's going on. It's just, just been turned into a childish state at this point. And years ago, th there was really some great stuff happening, but it's gone. It, those people are all gone. They just gave up, most of them. But uh, I have, um, I would like to continue now and then doing these conversations, you and I, about all kinds of subjects because we talk it out. Yeah. We talk it out and we hopefully give people something else to think about when they talk it out with someone else or form their own opinions. They have another viewpoint, which is so important to listen to. These I would like to do with you, Randy. Otherwise, I have now been spending about five hours a day, not every day because it's exhausting, and I'm just about finished now with the first one. I have one book ready, and I'm going to self-publish it on Amazon, and it's going to be split up into e-books and then a paperback of all these wonderful experiences. And as I was editing it of all these people over the years, I only put in my best stories that I feel which told to me as true. And I have stories of ex encounters and experiences, not all abduction, of all kinds of unknown things, that happened to people that are ex just so interesting and were told to me so well that I had to share them. I couldn't just let them die away. So I'm working on my first book, and then I have a second one. And then you have to write, too. And you have to write one, or we'll write one together. Yeah. But that I, I want to put out there, because then that will be all out there for people forever to look at and read if they want to. But what I've been doing with a, you know, 
a blog and this and that and article. It doesn't work because you are totally against a wall of fraud and and um, crazy people that are out there for all kinds of agendas that have nothing to do with solving the questions about the unknown. And that's sad. And I've also been heavily emailed and contacted and by people telling me these ridiculous stories or trying to send me these fraudulent tapes and pictures of all kinds of things that are not interesting, been done yeah, a thousand yeah. times by a million other people and get over yourself, no, and I don't want to do this anymore. And if I do come across somebody that tells me an amazing story, I will still write it, but I'm going to put it in one-way books. But um, that's what I've been There doing. are still good stories to be told. There's information that needs to go out. Right. And, uh, but I'll do it with you like this or in a book, but no more just floating around the Internet with all the crazies. No. Makes you know, me look crazy. <laughs> this is the conversation I had with a friend of mine last night. I said in the beginning... When I started doing this, I was convinced they would shut us down. I now realize that what they did was worse. They have now paid um, all kinds of people, and this is documented by the NSA and the CIA as well. They've, they've paid people to go out there and basically um, paper over everything that we've done for years with just complete asinine bullshit like the alien sex fiend story and all the other yes. things that are sitting yes. out there on the internet. And as a result of that, all they're doing is creating a giant tidal basin that's washing all this stuff under. And mm -hmm. so, you know, our only hope right now is that we just, we're going to do it, we're going to do it with integrity. And right. the people who need to speak will have a platform and the people who need to know will have a place to get the information. We're right up against the end of this 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 show, and, and Chris, um, I want to give you any final thoughts you want to sift through here and anything you want to leave people with. I think the only thing I want to leave people with is to, to make sure that you don't cut yourself short, don't destroy your own future, and uh, use your free will and go out and learn as much as you can about as much as you can on every subject you can, because that's why you're here. That's why you're alive. Don't waste it. Don't waste it. You're just going to end up coming back in some other energy form that may not be. Yeah, you might not liking. like it. Yeah, you don't want to be. So, you you know, don't want to be a dumb do beetle. Now. Don't want to do that. You no. don't want to do it right. You don't want to roll that big ball around for your whole lifespan. <laughs> so anyway, um, you know, do that. Use your free will. Be, um, ask questions, be curious, and heed the warnings of those who may know more than all of us. And if they say live in a way that you're always prepared, you know, it's better to have and not need, then you know that old saying, then yep. need it and not have it. Exactly. Prepare for the worst, but think the best. And I think life will be fine. And come back and talk to Randy and I. Let us know what you're thinking. Let us know what you want us to talk about, and we'll do our best to think it out and talk about it the best we can. Yep, I think all of that, you know, if you wind this show back, you'll get the details and the nuances of it, and I think um, this was a worthwhile conversation to have just because both of us needed to get some of this stuff out. Um, I'm going to wrap it up here again. Chris Holly's website is um, theendlessjourney.blogspot.com. Just Google search or use your favorite search engine of choice, Chris Holly, and uh, you will find a trove of things there to ponder. Our website, this website, offplanetradio.com. We will be returning back to television, I suspect, in a few weeks. The podcast will continue, and uh, I look forward to all of it. Stay vigilant. Look inside, and remember the truth is out there. It's inside you. We'll be back with another show very soon. Good night, Chris. Thanks. Good night. This is Off Planet Radio.